In what sense does a nation have consciousness? In what sense does Math for Wisdom have consciousness? In what sense does any collective have consciousness? This is what we're going to work on today. This is the Math for Wisdom sociology study group uh, led by Aslam Kakar, who uh, is shortly going to be defending his PhD in global affairs at uh, Rutgers University. We're very excited. Uh, he'll be giving a, a distinguished lecture about that. So watch out for that. If you, have, if you want to go to an online party, ours are the best. And so uh, we have a wonderful group of people here of very different knowledge. You'll get to meet them. First, I'll give a 15 minute uh, talk about consciousness from the view of wondrous wisdom. Then Aslam will give a 50 minute talk on about consciousness you know, of a nation. Uh, he leads the Pashtun Studies Institute. Uh, so he'll be able to also talk about that. So why don't I then share my slides? In what sense does a nation have consciousness? And this is question is one that uh, I brought to Aslam because in another study group, uh, the Language of Wisdom study group, I work with uh, Jerry Northrup uh, to bridge our languages of wisdom. He has a relational symmetry paradigm that he's worked on for multiple decades. Um, and from his point of view, uh, he has a PhD in biophysics or, or maybe biochemistry, my, my microbiology, and he is an ecotechnologist. So how does how to interact with a biological system? And he did his postdoc uh, at the University of California, Davis, and he loves science, but he said, hmm, this is not addressing, and this was the early 70s. This was the hippie era, if, if you can imagine. And he was thinking, oh, uh, this doesn't speak to what I really think is real, you know, in life, the human experience, including consciousness. Uh, so he has a whole life adventure uh, you will have learned about in other videos. But in terms of his thinking, for me to understand it, this notion of universal consciousness, what does that mean? So in a certain sense, he built it into the whole world. He says, let's just assume or believe or suppose that everything is consciousness. And so I started to wrestle, well, what are we talking about? And so it turns out that in talking with Jerry, uh, some things like a human being are atomic in terms of consciousness, you know, but some things are conscious as aggregates and then like perhaps a nation. And then if that's true, then maybe the whole universe is conscious in that way. So let's be more concrete. I'll give Jerry a chance to comment on this slide. Uh, so, for example, in red, I've put, well, the human, according to Jerry, is conscious. So that's that's how we claim to be. But he believes um, or supposes that a proton and an electron are con you know have consciousness. But then I asked, well, what about a cell? And you know, what happens if a cell divides? Or what if there's mitosis or meiosis? Et cetera? He goes, well, a cell would be an aggregate of consciousness. Okay, so then the question is, I don't know how to understand that. But he also said that like a family or an organization or a nation can have consciousness. That seems more understandable to me. So if I understood that better, then I could understand in what sense a cell and other things could be have consciousness. And then this uh, uh, thought that, well, then it may just continue, you know, these aggregates of aggregates and such. And then so in that sense, the whole universe may possibly have consciousness. And um, any thoughts here, um, Jerry? Um. Basically, the, the whole concept here is that our organizations of conscious entities themselves conscious. And from my experience in uh, microbiology, looking at that, I saw a lot of uh, behavior there that looked like conscious behavior. And so it became an, a, a sort of a notion that, that yeah, um, I can be part of a nation or an organization that acts consciously. And maybe that is conscious because it's composed of conscious entities. So that's where it goes and extends back down to electrons and protons when you look at the math. So that's basically, but you've got it. And so now I wrestle with it further because, you know, as you maybe know about me, sometimes my mind is very critical and a lot of times I hold back, you know, so there's this huge tension in me. Uh, and I put all these concepts out here partly to show the question, like, well, what about quarks? You know, what about neutrinos? You know, because like protons are made up of quarks, let's say, right? Or 
Um, if what about humans? Okay, but then dolphins, you know, or crows are smart, or octopuses, or even slime molds are able to do problem solving. What about a sleeping body? You know, so if we're asleep, do we have consciousness, or did it go to sleep? You know, so to speak. Uh, what if we have a dead body? You know, so if an aggregate can have a consciousness, I mean, if yeah, so or a cemetery or a planet or a zip code or a galaxy or a microorganism or a protein. These are, you know, just some examples. But then I thought, okay, so these are just things. And so I'll be talking about how I think about consciousness. I go, well, are these things, but maybe to be more fair or to be more generous to say, well, these are systems. So consciousness, it's a property of a system that would be moment to say that just as Jerry was saying that we can interact with potentially, or somebody can interact with through a language. So, this idea that Jerry is interacting with a, 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 a maybe a can of biomass, you know, in some wastewater treatment plant, like that becomes okay in in a certain context, maybe may believable. And the question is, what is that all about? And you know, and can we learn something by looking at a nation? So, any thoughts here, Jerry? Uh, that's fine. Go go ahead. Okay, so I just wanted to not, you know, to be, yeah, so no, I no proceeded, I arrived at a very different direction. So that's why it's interesting, it's challenging, and then also to get uh, Aslam's input that you'll hear, and then all of all of us uh, will have fantastic input. I did, wasn't thinking about consciousness, but I was thinking about how to know everything. And so that ran into the, so where do you go into this knowing everything? But the idea is that, well, if I could know about human experience, because we approach everything through our experience. So if I could model human experience, that would kind of make the problem easier. But also absolute truth, like what is it that we really know? So that's very difficult. But if you could tell what absolute truth was, then you would be able to focus much better. So then when I was uh, 17, 18, I arrived at these building blocks uh, for how do you define things? So this idea like a learning cycle of taking a stand, following through, reflecting, taking a stand, following through, reflecting, that seems relevant for participation. And so if you look at like, let's say a, a vat of uh, bacteria or something, can, can you do that with them? Can they do that? Or there's difference between like free will and fate. So let's say opposites coexist, all is the same. For existence, you need two different ways of looking at things. Like maybe this chair exists or maybe it doesn't, but if it exists, it certainly exists. Or if it doesn't, it certainly doesn't. And then finally, four levels of knowledge, whether, what, how, why. And the idea is um, that um, these are describing mental states and that in a certain sense, these are frameworks that are defining uh, perspectives with regard to each other, and those frameworks are absolute. So if you are a student of wondrous wisdom, and which I've been documenting, there's uh, eight possible divisions of everything. With the seventh one, you get a full-fledged system, but it collapses, uh, because like if all are good and all are bad, well, then you get a contradiction. It's like the system has to be empty. You start back where you started with. So there's an eight cycle. And the idea is that there's three ways to move along this eight cycle. You can add a perspective, let's say like me, you know, that'd be one perspective or two perspectives, like somebody looking at me, that'd be you. Or a third perspective, three perspectives, somebody looking on the side, this type of relationship. So this is the framework. Um, and now how will this relate to, uh, so maybe to say like consciousness is like an activity and it's an activity of binding or balancing two other perspectives. And so uh, a nice way to think about this in the human mind is that we have two hemispheres. So this is this, you know, this was now just considered pop psychology, but for, for decades it was considered very interesting that uh, the left hemisphere is more, let's say, visual, or let's see, the right hand is the left hemisphere. So it's actually the right hemisphere for the left hand is considered more visual, intuitive, uh, irrational, maybe. And the left hemisphere for the right hand is considered more rational and maybe uh, linguistic and et cetera. So um, now in terms of, if you look neurologically, it turns out that's not quite true. But if you look in terms of the requirements of the mind as a system, that may very well be true. So if you look for that, if you need a mind that knows and a mind that doesn't know, and you need to have two ways to say the same thing, 
that'll be, um, then you may need a third mind to kind of relate them. So that's the model here that I'm saying. So in here it says system one, system two, there's a psychologist, uh, Daniel Kahneman, uh, who um, uh, they did psychological studies uh, with his uh, colleague Aaron Tversky, uh, saying there's a mind that we have that has lots of biases. It's very prejudicial. It gives very quick reactions. And then we have another mind with its own kind of cognitive biases. It's much slower, but more deliberate, let's say. And I'm claiming there's a third mind, which is what I would call consciousness. So the idea is that maybe one hemisphere or one type of mind is the champion of a hundred billion neurons or so that knows the answer. It knows what kind of ice cream uh, I want to eat. It knows what I want to do right now, but it only knows one answer. Then we have another mind uh, that thinks not in terms of what is or what is known, but what is not known in terms of not answers, but questions uh, in terms of slots, let's say, or variables. So it'd be like a, this linguistic mind, we have like 100,000 concepts that we reinterpret everything that helps us look at everything, let's say, logically, conceptually. And so emotion is a process that speaks, saying, hey, the cog the, these cognitive maps, these conceptual maps, they're not serving. They're not doing well. There's something they need to be adjusted. So they should be adjusted, and then cognition reimposes them. Now, what consciousness does, it's kind of like a break. It's saying that uh, don't hardwire your new map too early. Wait, 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 wait. When we feel peace, when we feel right, then you will hardwire it. So that's simple model. Now, if that's what consciousness is, you know, then you can look for it. Where is it? So something uh, I did uh, when we started this uh, sociology study group with Aslam, and I'm doing something similar with Jerry. I said, well, the way that I would like to understand sociology is to map out and systematize the ways of figuring things out in sociology. And I've done this for maybe 10 disciplines, and it, it, you get this pattern of about 24 different, exactly 24 different ways. But one way to think about them is that, uh, well, 12 of them are pre-systemic. Before you have a sociological system, you have to kind of do things in order to set it up. Like, what are we talking about? What does this mean? And then uh, once we have a system, then you can um, do like an algebra within that system. It's like a controlled environment. And there's three that are maybe most important, the beginning, the middle, and the end of this study. So um, the beginning would be to say, well, the sociologists should have a diary and kind of like study their own prejudices, study their own thinking, you know, reveal to themselves how they look at things. The central one is about determining self-identity. So like the central way of figuring things out in sociology is this very difficult question. Like, how do you determine the self-identity? Because like if the government asks, uh, that could be problematic because people may not give the right, you know, the answer. They'll give the answer to the government once, let's say, or they'll or allows or whatever. And then finally, um, if I can see, I can't really see the top of my screen. Oh, the view from above, you can model society. So you could do it maybe with uh, a computer. You know, you could set up a system and play, do simulations, etc. So the parts that I just want to emphasize here um, are the ones relevant for our discussion today is um, the difference between the unconscious and the conscious in terms of sociology. So if you look at... And we can tell this by just studying sociologists. You know, what are they doing? So some of them are very much like ethnographers or, or, or uh, anthropologists. You know, they'll document, let's say, a tribe or a people. You know, they'll do personal observation. They'll codify it. Let's say they're studying a marketplace in Peru or something like that. And then they'll make evaluations. But basically, they're describing this culture by what they observe. They become a member of the culture by personally observing. They introduce, they create a language, like, you know, what are the types of stalls in the marketplace? And then they finally basically do like moral judgments, like what's working, what's not working, what's helpful, what's not helpful. Uh, so basically I'm saying that's how you get the unconscious culture of a society. But another way to do it is to look at what how people behave. You know, like if you give people freedom, uh, what will they do? So like when the Cold War ended, Lithuania uh, declared independence, and that was great. Everyone was happy, and almost a million people left. You know, So it's sad, but they had the freedom. What did they do? It's a sociological thing. Or if you constrain them, what will they do? Uh, if you help them, what will they do? If you let them, you know, if they, if they organize themselves, what will they do? So these are very much economic uh, types of analyses. And that's kind of like the conscious rational mind. And so it's no surprise in economics, you're studying the rational 
um, being, so to speak. And how do you relate these two? This is that learning cycle. And in sociology, it seems to be policy. So you define a policy, and it's about governing society, typically through the state, but not necessarily. But you define a policy, you intervene with the policy, then you evaluate the intervention, and you go on. So you have this policy formation. And that defines what your society is, you know, especially through this lens of self-identity. But what does self-identity mean? It could be an individual actor. It could be the individual that you see in documents, how they're documented. It could be classifications like subgroups of individuals. It could be intersections of these subgroups, which is kind of like the why. You're trying to say why are these happenings. And then you relate all these things in six different ways. So that's another topic. But to say, OK, so we're looking for signs of consciousness of a nation. And so if the unconscious is this like ethnic cultural dimension, if the conscious is like economically what is in people's personal or self-interest, what is it what relates these two? And so if I look at the history of Lithuania, uh, I'm in Lithuania, and but I was born in America, so I can think of American history. Uh, we'll be able to think of Pashtun history or Ukraine or Russia or Israel or Palestine. But we're looking for things that bridge these things. And so I think um, um, we're looking for signs of consciousness of a nation. But in terms of bridging, the, bridging these things, um, it's about uh, shared values. It's about national will. And it's a lot about leadership. So like in Lithuania uh, in the late 1800s, you had a newspaper. Now, the Lithuanian language uh, in Roman letters was banned. And so, but they would smuggle it across the border. It was maybe only, this national newspaper was only 5,000 subscribers, but it was widely read and it was very influential. So this core group of nationalist thinkers, and these are peasants uh, or children of peasants, they're doctors, they're priests, uh, they developed um, these myths and they developed these stories and they 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 reached back into national history. Um, and so they developed like a Lithuanian mindset, so to speak, uh, which is where the modern Lithuanian na nation state came from. But my thesis uh, is that in doing so, they had to kind of appeal to both the ethnic culture and to the economic incentives. So like if these are, so for example, when Lithuanian soldiers fought for independence, um, they were promised they would get land, you know? So that's an economic incentive, you know? So when you're a leader, you have to figure out how to balance uh, the economic incentives with the uh, ethnic appeals. And so um, in the wondrous wisdom, one of the things that you look at is understanding, um, which is like separating, especially like the good and God. So this notion of like, is there some bigger viewpoint out there that would care about your nation or your people? And is there some kind of goodness, uh, like a slack, let's say, that uh, you could enjoy? So the, the tension between the slack and the goodness and like life is the fact that God is good. Eternal life is understanding. God doesn't have to be good. Life doesn't have to be fair. But so that's the setting for understanding. Then you can have self-understanding, okay, where you understand yourself. Well, we can kind of maybe see that in things like division of powers. So when you have uh, legislative, executive, judiciary branches distinguished, that tells you maybe this is more than just individual people. Maybe there's a collective more. When you have, uh, or like the distinction between secular and religious might be also, for example. Uh, the power of determining identity, like who gets to be Lithuanian and who doesn't, you see. So that's a changing question. You know, are Lithuanian Jews Lithuanian or not? And it was decided at different points that they are, and during the Holocaust that they're not, you know, and then that they are, that type of thing. But then you have shared understanding. And so that would be like a shared national consciousness. And I think when you see a shared history which evolves, so like in American history, the civil rights movement changed our understanding. The Civil War changed the understanding. Uh, the changing narrative, you know, it's still being like when... Nikki Haley says, well, I don't know what the Civil War was about. That's because, uh, like I was taught in school, it was not about slavery. It was about uh, state rights, let's say. That's what, you know, this understanding changes. So um, that's a sign of co national consciousness that it is changing. There's the expression of the national will, as with elections and treaties. And then there's people who are given basically the authority, either morally or legally, to express the national will. And then finally, the highest level understanding is kind of like the good child who gets lost at the airport. He says, I, I'm the child. They're the parent. I shouldn't go looking for them, but they should be looking for me. I should go where they will find me. So it's like the like God's view of the person's view of the God's view of the person's view of the God's view. It's like all stretched out. 
So I think it is a sign of consciousness of a nation to say, hey, our nation serves a higher purpose. You know, we have a mission, right? Now, I'm not saying that has to be good or bad, but if you look at your, you know, that, you know, that we should do the right thing, right? Let's say, and appealing to shared values, you know, like to say, this is the American way, you know, or this is the Lithuanian way. Like, that means, that suggests that there is a national consciousness, which is more than just like mob activity, but this appeal, you know, this articulation and this appeal to that. So I'm trying to wrap this up, but so when I look at that um, in discussing, and this was another video where with Islam, he has a social theory toolkit that he works with, uh, six different, well, five different concepts. I added a sixth, this vision. And um, originally when we talked about it, it was about the individual. You can analyze, you can analyze in terms of what I called uh, social structure, but I'm realizing for this case, it's showing it's really about culture. It's really about the mythology or the language or these things that are coded into us that we're kind of born into us, right? That's very unconscious. But co national consciousness, I propose, is about leadership and developing shared values. You can see it in the history. And so that comes from like vision. You can see it in the policy that become from like action. Identity may be related to social structure, like where the structure tells you who you are. And it's very hard to resist that, let's say. And then maybe technology like relates to nature. So this is, uh, and finally, that's uh, my last slide, but just looking for signs of consciousness in general, this goes back to what Jerry was talking about, that, um, well, what is consciousness? So I'm saying, I'm not going to say that consciousness is fundamental or that everything is, but rather I have signatures for it. So if you see this eight cycle, like in math, I'm trying to work out if bot periodicity is... Uh, an example of that. It's not clear, but there's uh, it's uh, uh, hopeful. And another signature would be like these three minds. If we can find that, then we can maybe propose that, oh, that's a sign of consciousness. So for example, like any mammal has two, or I think any invertebrate, like two brain hemispheres is very popular. And so I'm saying like, I think that if, if my hypothesis is correct, I would propose that they may not have consciousness, but they have the makings of it. And then you could engage it by supporting consciousness, just like when you could talk to an infant, you step in, you step out, you kind of engage them, you kind of stand back, you flirt with them, and then that helps them flicker on their consciousness, because we're not conscious, we don't have consciousness all the time, but it's flickering. But with a puppy, I think you could do it too. If you could learn how to, a puppy would step in and step out and flirt with that boundary, you could have a, you could do experiments where a puppy could be momentarily consciousness, where it's deciding, does it want to step in? Does it want to step out? It's the puppy's choosing. So maybe you could do it with a vat of bacteria, you know, it'd be very interesting to try. But certainly, like, it doesn't have to be just invertebrates. Octopuses, which are highly intelligent, also have this. So it's suggesting that they have the prerequisites for consciousness. If you look in bot periodicity, there's this very interesting thing that we live in a world of um, what they call isometries, of spheres, let's say, and you can move a sphere about by rotating but you could also reflect it, like basically flip everything inside out. Uh, but those are two, then rotated, but those are two different worlds. And mathematically and physically, it seems very plausible that there's a universe and a mirror universe. And so one of the universes could be material, but the other one could be like this universe of flows and spirit, et cetera. That's, that would be a sign that possibly the whole universe is conscious, has consciousness above and beyond that. With regards to um, bot periodicity, I just heard a wonderful talk by... Uh, Nicole Fury, a um, a physicist who's in love with the Octonians, but um, they had this model uh, where they use bot periodicity. And what it would suggest is that it's possible that every particle, uh, whether it's a fermion or boson, is uh, since it has bot periodicity, it has the template for consciousness. Consciousness could be acting on it. So it may not, it's maybe not conscious itself or could be, but it has the it's, it has the code, so to speak, that could be operated on by something that's exhibiting consciousness. And similarly, there's a Krebs cycle, like everything that has DNA has metabolism, has, well, they say it's a 10 cycle, but maybe it's an eight cycle, but it's an eight cycle of enzymes and pro, you know, proteins that are catalyzing each other. And they, they just keep going round, 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 round. That's fueling all of our, um, all of our cells. But in advanced cells, like in uh, where eukaryote, eukaryotes, I think, and plants are eukaryotes and maybe fungi too, we have mitochondria. So they're in our energy cells, these mitochondria. And so the Krebs cycle would be, um, so it's kind of like, I don't know if it's Star Wars, but it says like, you know, inside the mitochondria or something, there's some kind of, so that's how it is with us is that uh, 
we have these. Uh, so what it just says with regard to Jerry, you see, it makes everything much more clear. Like maybe a cell has consciousness available, but maybe it's like a family, you know, because it's just not clear. So, but but this is a way of kind of trying to uh, approach that. And so this is what I offer to begin with. And now I'll uh, hand it over to Asla. Wow, Andreas, I don't know if you left anything for me to, to say about this. <laughs> Fascinating. As I said, uh, this this is every time uh, you know you speak, uh, you leave me wondering if I have anything you know important to say. But I will I will start with. Um, so I'm not uh, because of my dissertation. I don't think I am as prepared as you are. But I'll share my thoughts on on this. So I'll start with. So there will be two parts. One is generally trying to understand what consciousness is, as you talked about, and then what is, and linking it to the idea of national, national consciousness, political consciousness, right? So, so I think in growing up, you know, and especially since I have, uh, since, since, you know, I started reading English and thinking in English, so the word consciousness has come up usually in the sense that most people think or understand it to be self-critical, reflective awareness, right? It's alive to the experience, wakefulness, um, that's, that is how people, I think, normally in society understand it. But then the question is, well, what about the non-wakefulness state when we are asleep, when we are in karma, when we are, you know, not uh, active um, to, to the experience or alive to the experience? Is that also consciousness or what is that? So this morning I started reading a very interesting um, article uh, on the origin and evolution of human consciousness. And so... The word consciousness, it, it claims, come from a latent term, conscientia, conscientia or consensia, which means knowledge shared with others. So in fact, the latent term uh, stems from the combination of two words, C-O, S-C-I-O, which means I know and come, which means with, I know with, so it's a shared knowledge, right? And the it says the etymology of the term thus indicates that consciousness refers to a form of shared relational or social knowledge, right? Um, and then I think from my understanding and reading of, of um this phenomenon, um, it, I think it's still the case that it remains an enigma to philosophers, to uh, neuroscientists, uh, and, and, and it's, I don't think there is a, a definitive uh, understanding of what it really is, uh, right? Of course, there is a sense of uh, what it is, what it could be, but I think uh, there is still a long way to go. So in this study, um, it says that in in more in moreover in both common language and neuroscience, consciousness has been linked to self awareness. Um, and according to one scholar, uh, Zimmern, there are at least five different ways of understanding self uh, self awareness. One is the first corresponds to the awareness of being at the center of the attention of another human being, which is self-conscious. The second to the awareness of one's own sensations, perceptions, and actions, uh, which is self-conscious as self-detecting. The third is the ability to recognize one's own image in the mirror, which is self-conscious as self-recognizing. And then the fourth is to the awareness of one's own mental states and those of others, 
self-conscious as aware of awareness. Finally, self-awareness is also intended as a narrative self-awareness. Self-consciousness as self-portraiture uh, and autobiography. So this, these are the five different ways of um, understanding what self-awareness is. So in, in the, I'll, I'll skip to the final uh, um, section of this, this very interesting article, Origins and Characteristics of Consciousness in Homo Sapiens. So um, what it, I would like to read this, this uh, paragraph to you and then just go on to um, briefly review the four different, uh, the five different characteristics that it outlines. So it says that the social and cultural dimensions exhibited by Homo sapiens distinguish the species from other primates. As regards the social dimension, human beings are born, grow up and live in social contexts nested inside each other. The nucleus of human sociality is the mother-child dyad in the extended family in which little humans develop about 10 to 15 individuals. Some families meet periodically and constitute so-called bands, about 30 to 40 individuals. Five or six bands form a village or a clan of about 150 individuals, while about 10 villages constitute a community, about 1,500 individuals. That's probably, that's smaller, that is three times the size of my village in Pakistan. It's 500 people, so this is 1,500. The British evolutionary psychologist Robin Denver has shown that human group size, families, bands, clans, and communities is a universal characteristic, which is present in every social structure of hunter-gatherers in any part of the world. And furthermore, neuroanthropological research by the same scholar indicates that the size of the fundamental human group, namely that of the village of or clan, 150 individuals, was one of the main factors connected with the progressive growth of the cerebral co cortex in the homo species versus other species of human primates. So well, that's the first characteristic. The second they say is that the main feature of Homo sapiens is its high propensity for cultural learning. So cultural learning by culture, they mean the ability to develop specific types of learning concerning social behavior. Um, then there is the construction of tools, the learning of a language, the appropriation of typical habits and customs of a society, such as clothing, culinary traditions, religious traditions, and etc. And um the third uh another cognitive aspect that appears to be typical of the human species and some of its ancestors uh is the ability to cooperate i think this is also anthropologists have talked about this right that humans the human ability for cooperation which is associated with the emergence of theory of mind, the ability to attribute beliefs, intentions, thoughts, and moods to oneself and to others. So I think this idea of like belonging to a religion of a nation, this is, I think, uh, at the um, at the core of, of, of uh, humans that we can imagine uh, entities, uh, you know, or, or you, you, like the, the possibility of belonging to to something that is, you know, not in front of us. So, like, what is a nation, right? So, there's the ability to imagine that oh, you can be part of something like religion, abstract, or or a nation. Uh, then, finally, language is what mostly radically distinguishes human cognition from that of other animals. Language does not only represent a doubly articulated communication system, but also a cognitive faculty that allows humans to expand their creativity and knowledge in, in, in an almost infinite way. So all this to say that um, th th this also relates to one of the, uh, I think the three articles that I had shared a couple of weeks ago, um, Language, of course, has, has played uh, an important role in, in 
uh, imagination, in aspirations, and in uh, in and I'll talk in a moment about you know the the in the modern sense of nationalism. What does it mean to have a nation? What does it mean to uh, to be a part of a group? So language plays uh, a very important role. So I'm not a neuro scientist or neuropsychologist, so uh, I'm very curious and uh, interested in the idea of consciousness in, in, in that sense, but at the same time, I think I'm more uh, equipped to uh, think of consciousness uh, as, a, as part of a political or national, uh, you know, uh, you know, how it is uh, demonstrated, how is it understood, um, you know, in, in, in the political sense, in the national sense. So I want us to, to go back in time and imagine the world in 1920 and what was it like? So, so what I want to um, what I want us to imagine is the world in 1914. Um, this is how it looked like. The French, the British controlled most of the world. In fact, 60% of the world. In 1920, there were only 60 countries, right? And um, First World War, and then the Second World War, and the collapse of these empires, and the process of decolonization and self-determination, they, they start and more and more countries um, become independent. Now, in the second slide, as you can see, this is the European control in 1975. It's reduced to, uh, it's almost non-existent, right? I mean, in the most formal sense, direct control, colonial control. In this slide, you can see the number of countries which became independent in decades following World War II, right? The most, uh, most of these countries were um, Middle East, Sub-Saharan, Africa, mm, I think the majority in Sub-Saharan Africa. But as you can see, another way to look at this is um, very few countries um, are formed recently, right? from uh, the 90s onwards um, compared to uh, the time prior to the 90s, it's uh, significantly small. Although there are groups, nations, uh, which want self-determination and self-determination looks something like this. So it's either more autonomy within an existing state or it is merging with a neighboring country, you know, Pashtuns, if for those of you who don't know, are an ethnic group uh, or a national group, subnational in Pakistan, which there is an aspiration that one day there will be, although it is more, I would say, um, it's not active, it is a latent separatist kind of aspiration that one day there will be an independent Pashtunistan in which the Pashtuns of Pakistan and Afghanistan will live together. The Kurds have, um, uh, you know, in four different countries, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Turkey, um, there is also a self-determination uh, movement going on. Some of them want, I mean, there is again, the some segments are, um, promoting this idea of active, very active separatist movement. Others are more in the latent sort of uh, stage, but there is this aspiration to become, um, to either for now gain more autonomy or, you know, if that doesn't happen, hopefully one day all these different parts of Kurdistan will merge and become a nation. And then, um, or if that doesn't happen for each of these uh, you know, Kurdish communities within these four countries becoming independent. Now, why am I uh, sharing this? I think 
for us to understand national consciousness or the consciousness of a nation, of a political group, of an ethnic group, in the modern sense, uh, it's important to, I think, historicize, you know, the, the development and the evolution of, of these phenomena, these movements. So imagine, I mean, there were, so in 1920, there were 60 countries, and now we have 200 countries, but there are hundreds and hundreds of groups, right? Ethnic groups, ethno-linguistic groups, groups that are homogeneous religiously, um, groups that are, um, and a lot of these groups are oppressed. So I gave you the example of the Kurd, Black people in the US, Pashtuns in Pakistan, um, you know, the movement in uh, Catalonia, in Northern Ireland, in Scotland, and I mean, and so on and so forth. So um, for me, I think consciousness uh, in the sense of, uh, you know, property of a nation, of a community, of a um you know, of an ethnic group is um, more, uh, I would say, a recent development, like in the 20th century, right? All these states uh, gained independence and then these groups, um, you know, came under the rule of um, these different, uh, you know, uh, countries where they didn't feel like they belong. So now I'll, I'll, I'll try to show that with the distinction between state nation and a nation state. So uh, the way I understand is that nation state is uh, a state or a country where a nation existed and it created a state. A nation uh, again, these are all constructs. I mean, none of this is, I don't uh, look at identity as a primordial sort of uh, uh, phenomenon, by which I mean primordialism is this idea that ethnicity or any identity is rooted in objective reality and that it is externally given. So for me, it is, uh, I, I, my approach is more uh, constructivism, that this is constructed. Um, there is, um, I think it's uh, indefensible to say that uh, I am a Pashtun and I have always, or my ancestors have always remained as Pashtuns and from the beginning of time and they will remain so until the end of time. I think that is a very, uh, deterministic and problematic uh, approach. And I think we have seen in in our world, I mean, what uh, has been done on the basis of this kind of understanding of identity. I mean, the European said, uh, well, we will go to the Orient and, uh, you know, give these guys a lesson or two because they are uncivilized, they are brutal, they are static, they are and we are the ones. It is. It is our burden, the white man's burden. So I think that, um, or what was said and justified. Um, I mean about uh, black people and Jews, and so primordialism is this idea that it is uh, fixed, that it is a given, that it is fossilized, that this is you know is very problematic. So constructivism is also I, I I also don't really adhere to the constructivism idea in the sense that oh it's all constructed I mean it is constructed but we have to deal with with a fair degree of objectivity in in the social construct right like let's say if black people say well we are oppressed because we are black and you say it's all made up you know this is you're just using identity politics that is a very problematic uh, response because there, there is truth to the subjective objectivity of these uh, phenomena, right? It's not entirely objective as like gravity. It is not entirely objective as other concepts proven 
in science, but it is objective, just like in the sense of our agreements on things, like money, for example. We agree on money in a certain sense. We agree on having a state. So these, this is this is uh, right. Um, but if you go to Pakistan and you want to buy something in, in a village by giving dollars, that's not going to work, right? They're going to ask for money, like Pakistani rupees. So in that context, I think there is, of course, uh, this, uh, the, it is constructive, but there is, I think, a fair degree of objectivity. So um, that's my understanding. And then the in instrumentalism with this idea that, you know, oppressed, not necessarily oppressed, but, but some individuals from minority groups or from some groups use ethnic politics or national politics as a way, as an instrument to access power, to uh, gain to have material gains. Um, and that may happen, but oftentimes uh, a, this is used by groups from privileged, dominant, uh, by dominant and privileged groups to discredit the, sometimes the genuine and, uh, grievances and claims of oppressed groups that Oh, these are ethnic entrepreneurs, and they're just using this to, you know, to access. Um, that can happen. I mean, I think some say that, for example, in uh, uh, former Yugoslavia, uh, you know, how it disintegrated, there was a lot of, uh, I could be wrong, so you can correct me, but that's from my reading that uh, leaders from different ethnic religious groups used uh, their identity to foment some kind of, a, you know, that led to the disintegration and ethnic cleansing. And, uh, but the point Islam, back to... Oh, yeah. Are you ready to summarize here or do, or do you have much yeah. more to say? No, no, I'll summarize. So I, I was saying that I think ethnic or, or national consciousness is, of course, you can see it both at the level of a state in a nation. So like, what does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to be a Pakistani? What does it mean to be a Tavinian? What does it mean to be, I don't know, British? Um, but it also, that um, is one, I think, dimension of looking at it, but it also, in the sense of like people groups um, who, live in, I, I think I didn't finish this distinction between nation state and state nation. So nation state, a nation exists and the state is created. And that is more in the sense of like, there is a, either religious homogeneity or there is linguistic homogeneity. Like in the US, right? You have 40 million black people. They've been oppressed for hundreds of years. But they share English as a language and they also share religion as a language with the US, and we don't see a separatist movement, right? So that contributes to their consciousness. Like, what is their national consciousness? I mean, if this were, let's say, if they didn't speak the same language, if they didn't share the same religion, Black Muslims were more radical than Christian Muslims in, in American, uh, in, in Black politics and resistance, right? So um, that is an important thing, I think, to understand. The other is state nation. A state exists and then it creates a nation like Pakistan. It is a, it mm -hmm. is composed of a multitude of ethno-linguistic um, entities and groups. So the state came into being and then the state took on the project of creating a nation. And the nation, um, by using two things, Urdu language, imposing a language on all groups and imposing a religious ideology, Islam. So the twin cultural symbols of Islam and Urdu language was used by the state to create the nation. So I don't know if this made any sense, but these were some of the some of the um, um, 
you know, highlights and major themes that I wanted to discuss. And uh, especially uh, maybe I was very disorganized because I'm, my head is all in my dissertation. So uh, thank you for listening. Let's, let's give a round of applause to Aslam. Thank you, everybody. And so uh, this is, um, thank you, Jerry, for the inspiring the topic. Thank you, Aslam, uh, for hosting this group. I think I'll be the moderator. And what we're very excited to hear uh, these participants. We've never had such a great uh, crowd uh, with us uh, or, or a, a beautiful family is probably a better way to say it. So I will suggest an order because we really want to hear from our new people first. So this is the order. Uh, and if you don't want to speak right away, you can pass. If You know, you don't have to speak at all. But this is what I would like. So first of all, Indre, um, uh, Daniel, Samuel, Franz, John, Edmundus, Kirby, Jerry. And so then what I'll also like is like, because Aslam um, is the one who's investigating this question, Jerry inspired this question. So Aslam and Jerry, if you ever want to jump in, you know, with a 30 second, you know, 60 second comment, uh, do that because that'll help glue this together. My first talk, I'll try to do less of that. Um, but, uh, but I just do want to summarize Aslam's talk from my point of view. What he told what I grabbed on from what he said was that let's look at human beings from the long view of history, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. What have humans been like? And there have been these groups of different sizes from the families to the clans to the communities or villages. And so if we're talking about consciousness, obviously it didn't have nations then, but they had some kind of, uh, but did they have, does it make sense to talk about the consciousness of a clan, the consciousness of a village, etc.? That's a question, but that's something that would be a very natural way to ground this. Then uh, also this, uh, then the reality of nations that like, if you're Pashtun, this dream of a Pashtunistan, it's understandable. Like maybe it'll never be real or whatever, but the idea is that if you talk to a, I think there's something real about the idea uh, that's un basically undeniable. It's just too real. People would die for such things. So hopefully not, but um uh, then the idea that's very helpful, um, several ideas actually, this distinction between the primordial understanding, oh, this is like, you know, we were just born this way, you know, we were, you know, this is our mother's milk, right? Like you get it from your mother, let's say, right? That's what I was saying is the unconscious. The idea of the constructivist saying, oh, it's like money, you know, we just invent this, right? Or like, it's like the nation of Pakistan, we'll figure out how to do, you know, you know, that's the constructivist point of view. And then the instrumentalist, you know, the very nice example of Pakistan, like, we will create a nation. This is a national project. That's highly consciousness. And typically it may come from the elites, but the idea is that they're trying to get everyone into this, possibly so that they could all fight a war, but, you know, for whatever reason. Um, so that matches very nicely to what I was saying. Also, this idea of the state versus the nation. If you think of, like, I was trying to say, like, with this uh, understanding, self-understanding, shared understanding, good understanding, that you have, let's say, human's view of God's view, and then human's view of God's view of human's view is self-understanding. Human's view of God's view of human's view of God's view would be shared understanding. Human's view of God's view of human's view of God's view of human's view would be good understanding, like your relationship with God, let's say. But imagine if there was, like, um, you have a, and I don't know which way to go, but like a, a nation state right? And then you have a nation-state nation, right? Then you have a nation-state nation-state, and then you have a nation-state nation-state nation, something like that. Because like with Lithuania, you know, we're a nation-state, but we have to learn, well, how do you include minorities in a nation-state, you know, and what are the rights of those minorities? And then how, how do we have to all say, you know, we have to be there for each other, right? That becomes very mature, and, and you can see that the level of conscious. Enough of me. So, Indre, would you uh, share your thoughts? with us. But you'd have to unmute yourself. Yeah, in some places you guys lost me <laughs> with oh. the amount of information and with all kinds of physics and stuff going in. Um, yeah, it's also, it's, I guess it's pretty interesting that that we think of a conscious things versus not conscious or unconscious or subconscious, uh, which is probably the bread of, of, of psychologists usually. <laughs> and 
yeah, digging out what is what is in the collective, maybe sometimes unconscious going on. Uh, also with the brains, um, I am not fully sure that it's totally, uh, so to say, correct or accurate. Uh, uh, what I hear recently now, I mean, it's like we have this kind of uh, reptilian brain or uh, so to say, which comes, I mean, which is deeper areas and they go in both sides of the hemispheres. Um, and, and these are deeply related to emotions and to, uh, to very early experiences. Uh, uh, to the children feeling safe and what not, right? So, um, it makes sense to me that uh, uh, that uh, our consciousness or our awareness of ourselves uh, develops through the uh, others mirroring to us or others giving us some kind of uh, feedback or uh, some ideas of, uh, um, of of are we important uh, do they care about us um, is the world safe uh, are we waited are we loved uh, are we welcome here and stuff like that um, so uh, I would not need a, a third area in the brain to explain that it's really somebody else. I mean, we cannot, I mean, it's, it's, uh, in principle, it's a, a nonsense that, that, I mean, we cannot think of ourselves being separate from others. It's, it's, uh, logically impossible. I mean, it's, uh, if, if a child is, I mean, a, a child, yeah, I mean, I guess Ratzinger was talking about this philosophically that, I mean, it's a dualism in, in principle. I mean, the, the, the mom and the child are uh, one, but they are two different bodies. And uh, it does not, I, and, and the one needs to, um, so to say, to, to, I don't know, not sacrifice, but to, um, to take care of the other one. And the situation does not change when the child is born. I mean, it's, and this taking care of each other uh, is our permanent situation. It's, I mean, we are never alone and isolated. We are, it's not possible for us to even, I mean, survive without, uh, without the care of others for, for very long time. Um, we also know that if children are lost somewhere in the jungle or whatnot, and some animals maybe adopt them and so on, if you lose some important uh, periods where where language develops where certain other things go on i mean they they cannot be they cannot be brought back i mean the, this is lost i mean the child does not learn to walk on two or maybe it does not learn how to talk and and so on and how to so under uh, understand sometimes and behaves like an animal that that uh, um, that we're raising him. So, so how do we connect that to the? Yeah. You say very important things. To the how do we connect yeah. that to the? Well, how do you want to connect to it? it... Yeah. The, so, to some extent, I mean, I, I really think that um, some kind of I don't know uh, place uh, is necessary where the um, where the opinions are exchanged or thoughts are exchanged ideas develop um in current times it's i don't know how much people really do I, well I, in lithuania like i i don't know how much people really do communicate about the state about the 
nation about I, the idea of the nation is kind of I don't know it's a pretty sad narrative right now I guess so all, uh, all, and all, then everyone compares it to the times like before before the Soviets were coming and it's a huge contrast contrast to what it is now and uh, uh, so I'll, I'll jump in I, here I also oh, uh, another idea yeah maybe you want to say your other something? idea your other idea um, is uh, I'm currently somehow interested in the traumatized brain or, or mm -hmm. uh, I mean people with trauma and this is for post uh, totalitarian countries uh, important a lot and from what we know about uh, trauma patients or trauma research it's also clear that uh, I mean this survival reptilian brain takes over there are a lot of circuits going on there and uh, it does not usually reach the cons consciousness and then the cortex part <laughs> of the brain mm. and uh, um, the people not only have uh, I mean they have trouble being in presence and being there and absorbing and realizing what is going on around them also with them and um, it's like really this dissociation a lot so, so that, that uh, speaks and, to this idea that consciousness is we're not like in full consciousness all the time you know that and so and if we're traumatized and it's even be... more with it's even more i mean it's even more with trauma and even right. more when there were problems with attachment so if if so <laughs> if what i want to have attachment now, uh, i want to give problems, you problems yeah Indri, i want to give you a pass which means like if you just like with Islam or, or Jerry, you know, if you think that there's something important you want to say, then jump in. OK, and then we'll let other people speak. Yeah. Is that fine? But this is very important. We're, we're trying to create a space, which is like you say, where people can be together. Uh, uh, and you're very precious. That's what I want to say. Is that anything more did you want to say right now or not? Uh, I now understand why you had the problem like, oh, we have such a male audience. <laughs> I mean the group. You are our jewel, and also um, you're a you're a Thomas's uh, wife. Thomas couldn't be today. Uh, he's a friend of uh, me and John, uh, a physicist, and uh, I'll just say he's. Um, I, I visit him once a month. I get to tell him about my philosophy. Sometimes, most recently, at your home, you know, your apartment. But um, he's a devout Catholic. He really loves God, and so being a theoretical physicist, like. That's something that's not you don't get to talk about very much, let's say, at uh, work or other places. So to create an environment where all these things are possible, that's what I want to. That's why we're happy here. So can I can we continue now with uh, Daniel and then jump in, Indre? Is that fine? If you like. Uh... OK, Daniel, please. Uh, we just recently met. I'm very excited. But you can talk about yourself and your. Thank talk. you for the invitation and the kindness. I'm new here. So. First, I acknowledge the trade-offs related to the recorded linearized emission of symbolic language for these multi-scale issues. So more for the prompting than the resolving. There was the question in the presentations and the chat of the fundamental definition. So not for nation, but for consciousness. We have worked on this in 2019 with the ant colony consciousness paper, not to address whether ants at nest mate or colony level have this or that, which is what a lot of people have tried to do, but rather to start with the ant colony and take a reverse direction. And there are people who disagree about the conscious states of humans in different life stages, humans overall. And so that really helped us reframe to the epistemic humility and the pluralism and the ambiguity in the definitions and just how much rides on this question. So cheers for the discussion. Also, it was brought up these multiple uh, material, historical, future-oriented, functional, formal attributes of consciousness or nation or self or colony. And those are just all complex and they're all dynamical, even within one trace. So to generalize across them is um, quite a work. Um, I'm reminded of epistemic value and pragmatic value 
from active inference in our speech environment. So to what extent are we asking questions and making statements epistemically oriented to reduce our uncertainties or pragmatically oriented to trim tab in the moment so that we can observe what we expect and prefer in the future, for example, so-called political speech. And so in closing, it is important to maintain high situational awareness of the linearized speech environment we are in addressing these multi-scale scenarios, which at this point and probably fundamentally necessitate a dual view of the inside view from the outside. Thank you, Daniel. And then uh, we'll, I hope, I just want to say it's very exciting to get to know about you. And I know that you have all these different ways to um, add to this. So let's go to Samuel. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so um, I don't know. I guess first, first I'd like to point out that I guess, um, I don't know, I feel a bit of anxiety every time we get on a Zoom call and I have no idea how much time we have. And it's just kind of like words flying at you really, really fast. Mm -hmm. And um, and then it's going to cut off at some point without a formal uh, goodbye. It won't cut off anything. today. We're with <laughs> Islam. He's got us covered. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, that puts me in peace. So, okay. So um, I was kind of just listening I, 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 for the most part, agree with, like, the connections that Andreas was making with Aslam about, like, the, you know, consciousness, unconsciousness, identity. And, and it's interesting that you guys bring this up because we're going into an election year here in the United States. And I find, like, culturally, it's a very interesting time the election years because we live in a culture where everybody's highly individualistic. Like, we just you know, we live in isolation, even in a city of millions of people, we go back to our homes and we live in our box. But then during election year, there's this kind of crazy, like, group think that sets in where it's like, all of a sudden, you're either a Democrat or a Republican. And there's this like, butting of the heads. There's no other option. You you can't even get a word in edgewise about third party you know, possibilities or anything outside of what's already been established for us, which I think is insane because we're talking about consciousness. It's almost like it tanks during election year. It's like people shut off their their uh, their their critical thinking and they just float into the autopilot of like the stream of propaganda that's coming in from both sides. And it's like, I I don't know if there's like a end goal to this conversation, but I think personally, I would like to see some sort of um, I would like to see consciousness of a nation. I would like to see us uh, manifest the reality that we wish to create instead of uh, just kind of be spoon fed a reality that's already existed since long before we were born. I mean. I, you, yeah, I, my closest friends and family are like, oh, you know, the world is in shambles because everyone voted Democrat. And, and you know, you go back four years ago or whatever, and it was the same narrative except, oh, the world is in shambles because you voted Republican. And you look at American history, every single, you like, without fail, it's Republican after Democrat, after Republican, after Democrat, after Republican, after Democrat for the entire history of this country. And at a certain point, like as a, as a rational thinker, I think this is not democracy. There's no way that you could have that tight of a grouping of going back and forth and back and forth if we are actually consciously deciding these people. And and where's the third option, right? Or where, you know, and why wouldn't one of them be elected twice in a row or three times in a row or like some sort of spread other than 50% this, 50% that. And yet, you know, the crazy breakdown of consciousness is that like they will refuse to take accountability for their 50% of the destruction of our moral fabric, right? It's all their fault or it's all their fault, but it's their from my perspective, 50 plus 50 equals 100. They're both 100% culpable for destroying our alleged democracy. So 
very interesting conversation to be proposing at a very interesting point in human history, but okay, I don't know. <laughs> that's my okay, thought. I don't, that's okay, my so we, we accept your thinking there. That's helpful, Samuel. Franz, would you, would you, what would you share your thoughts with us, Franz, uh, on, uh, on whatever you think is helpful? Thank you, Samuel. I have trouble hearing you. I do you. not hear, hear you, Franz. Yeah. We can't hear you, Franz. Why don't we go to John and then try to see if you can get your sound going, Franz. John. Oh, hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, nice to see, you all, see all of you, meet, meet some of you. Uh, for the first time. Um, Aslan, I really appreciated your presentation. I thought it you know, brought up some really interesting ideas. Um, in particular, how construction, you know, const you know, the construction or constructivism um, approach to um, identity or ethnicity or um, I guess group identification you know, has is, is been used to discredit certain um, uh, freedom movements or separatist movements. It's an interesting, interesting idea. Um, I guess my concern, given the state of the world right now, is a little bit less abstract and more kind of um, geared toward understanding uh, well, certain large trends that I see going on globally, and in particular, one is violence. Um, the the variable of violence in identity, you know, identity movements and separatist movements and uh, national independence movements, because um, there are examples of very bloody revolutions, and there are examples of not so bloody revolutions. And I'd like to understand that a bit better. Um, and like I say, it's especially um, poignant, I think, given given the current state of affairs all over the world, um, either violence, you know, high level violence or outright uh, just threat of violence, you know, happening in some very, very, very um, unstable arenas around the world. So um, in could I ask us? Oh. In particular, and then we could know, have Aslam jump in because this is his topic, his thesis topic. So because violence, he could respond violence, to you. Mm -hmm. You know, violence has resulted in some very horrendous outcomes and has also solved certain problems in the past, too. You can't just completely discredit it because it seems immoral. And um, this is something I don't understand at a high level. Um, so that's something I, you know. And then Aslan, maybe maybe I'll any, ask you um, have resources. You you have any resources or um, thoughts? So John, on could that? you could you phrase that as a question? Because this is very what much what we wanted was like also questions. They help us think and research. How would you phrase it as a question? But maybe I'll let or or should I let Aslam respond first? To... Well, what is the what is the role of violence historically in nation building and nonviolence in nation building? And is nonviolence uh, uh, a a um, a credible alternative for going forward. Fantastic, Aslan. Yeah. So this is this is a fascinating question and a huge question, and I've spent six years on this, and uh, my research is on ethno-political movements um, and uh, the strategy of resistance uh, by oppressed. Uh, minority ethnic groups. And um, I study the Pashtuns in Pakistan and the Kurds in Turkey. Uh, there is a significant body of literature on both violent resistance and nonviolent resistance. And um, there is also this distinction that needs to be made in terms of what 
in the objective of a group, of an oppressed group, of, of, of a struggle by an oppressed group? Do they want self-determination, as I earlier uh, showed in, in one of the slides? Do they want political, civil, democratic rights within the framework of an existing state, right? Or do they want um, the extreme, uh, uh, you know, sort of, uh, I don't mean it in a, in a negative way, but the if the ultimate goal is um, separation, full secession, then that requires uh, a different uh, kind of strategy. So usually in the literature, um, self like movements which seek uh, full secession as in their own state, their own territory, their own government, their own population, they are more likely to engage in armed resistance, but there are exceptions to that too. For example, East Timur from Indonesia, it in, was engaging in, in violent resistance for, for a couple of decades, but then it shifted to a nonviolent resistance and it, it uh, became an independent state, right? I mean, there are a multitude of factors such as the role of regional and uh, great power politics, and there is the role of geography, there is a role of access to arms, there is a role of, um, you know, um, you, are you prepared for um, a violent uh, resistance? Um, and, and I think um, I would like to just say that uh, this is giving you a six years of work in a couple of minutes, which is uh, very challenging, but there is evidence that nonviolent resistance is more effective. Um, there is a study by Chenoweth and Stepan, <clears throat> Why Civil Resistance Works. They <clears throat> studied 323 campaigns um, in the past 100 years, and they show that nonviolent resistance in <clears throat> struggles for autonomy, for self-determination within a state are twice more likely to be more effective than violent resistance. And, but the question then for me is what, there are many oppressed groups. Why do some oppressed groups mobilize and others do not mobilize in the first place? That's one. The other part is what kind of strategy, what determines their strategy of resistance? That's the second uh, part. Now, um, I would first like to very quickly uh, uh, speak to the, the second question, what determines a group strategy of resistance? I think there are many factors. I think the first, and there are two broadly, two approaches, two theoretical frameworks. One is that one framework stresses agency, will, intention, goal, uh, ideology, leadership, the role of resources, access to resources, um, right? That is agentic approach. Um, uh, that describes um, or, or that stresses these factors, right? Probably uh, ethnic or political or national consciousness. How conscious is a nation? Um, how aware are they of their uh, existence or predicament? And so that's one. But then there is structural approach. Structural approach stresses the role of history, the role of the environment, geography, structures, uh, systems of ideas and structures such as um, how oppressive um, a state is, how, what are the opportunities for civil resistance, for nonviolent resistance? And there when we can make, again, uh, categorizations of states. There are authoritarian states which, where the opportunity for resistance is very, is very rare. It's, it's you know, if you, if you resist in, in, in a non-democracy, it's very hard. To, to do that, right? Especially if you are a group which is oppressed, you're a small group, and there is a fascinating theory by Terber, Chess Terber, the theory of social ties, which means two kinds of ties, regime ties, which means link to the ruling elites, especially in the security forces, and then link and grassroots ties, then 
connections to other groups in the society, in the community. So if, for example, my hypothesis is that if an oppressed group has strong social ties, a strong meaning has strong links to the regime and has strong links to other groups in society, they are more likely to be able to have civil resistance. For example, in Otpor movement in Serbia, a student-led pro-democracy pro uh, movement, of course, they had the support of other groups, but when they finally challenged Slobodan Milosevic in the capital, they gathered in th hundreds of thousands of numbers. The regime, including his wife, ordered the police, the capital police, to crack down on, on the gathering. What they realized was there were the children of the top security officials amongst the protesters. Now, that is the a movement's links to the regime. And that didn't work. Of course, they refused. How would you kill your own children, right? Sometimes it happens. I mean, in... in um, in, uh, but this in, is a in, this is a this was a good preview, I think, of your. We're going to have the full official. One last point. But in continue, Cambodia, continue. in the craze for revolution, uh, the the leadership of of the Khmer Rouge, you know, killed two two million people, including their own family members. So that was a very delusional sort of. I mean, and we can. Hopefully, when when the uh, when there is uh, time for uh, um, when I, once I'm done with the defense, um, mm -hmm. I'm happy to to share more ideas. On this. this is an excellent preview uh, for your distinguished lec math for wisdom distinguished lecture. Thank you, Aslam. I'll ask my father Edmundus uh, for your thoughts or questions. Well, thank you very much. I enjoyed both uh, both lectures and the discussion afterwards. I think basically I'll, I'll pass. There was <laughs> so much ground covered here, and uh, of course, uh, applying well, all of this uh, and uh, discussing uh, present day situations uh, is uh, is also very instructive. When I was young, in my twenties, I thought the world is changing for the better. Well, I'm not sure it is. No, not at my age. It's it's uh, some of these things that are happening are catastrophic. But uh, well, we need to address address these problems as they come up. So um, anyway, I enjoyed uh, I enjoyed both lectures and. Uh, I wonder if at some time in the future we could take the present uh, the world as it is, uh, its uh, nations and states, and uh, see how uh, what they are. are. Are there just three groups, or are there more than three groups? You know, which which three United groups? States? Well, uh, as uh, Aslam described, uh, the primordial, the construct, con constructive constructs and also the uh, instrumental uh, uh -huh. and in instrumental right okay so that'd be that'd be interesting uh, okay so that's an investigation that's an you win the prize <laughs> that's an investigation we can go through the yeah, different states I mean, and like we can try to states. see how they relate very good what is it that's so uh, but anyway, I just want to uh, say thank you very much, and uh, I wish you the very best, Aslan, for your dissertation and defending it. So good thank luck you so to you. Much. Uh, for always coming. We'll be happy to call you P a PhD, I guess. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank uh, you. Next so time. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, uh, and thank you, and Kirby. So, oh, just to say, uh, so now Kirby and Jerry are the last two will get a chance. So, and you, I will invite you to kind of like help us to wrap this all up, and then. If someone wants to say something more, you know, we'll have something more, and then we'll be concluding. Uh, maybe Aslam will have the final word. Kirby. Yes, thank you. There's a huge amount of content here. I wanted to do a plug for the readings, those PDFs that were circulated in advance. I had asked my question, can we have modern 
sort of nationalism without modern media like television and so on. I had asked myself that question before I realized that the reading was about the role of print media, one of the readings, in establishing nationalism in a European context. And before that, we had Latin, and they point out, you know, that was a important language, but it didn't impose a single ideology or nation consciousness. And then the vernacular has challenged Latin. It's like, why can't we write books in Italian and French instead of always Latin? More people will learn to read, and it's the language they speak. And sort of that gave rise eventually to these dreams. It calls them imaginary communities. And the way I think of nations is as collective dreams. We choose to dream them, we or we're convinced, or we don't even notice. It's unconscious. We grow up just in this dream that I'm in a nation and I'm a citizen of this or that. And you see from that map behind me over my shoulder there, I live in a ethnicity, let's call it, where we've wiped out the nations and this, they're a data layer, you can put them back, it's just a data layer. But I live looking at the world kind of without nations, but I do see everybody asleep and consciously choosing to dream nations. And it's not just one nation. To understand nation today, you have to realize there's a currency. Probably you have an airline. You have stamps. You have a flag. You have a military. And you have a curriculum, a curriculum that schools you in your national consciousness, which you need to have. I like the talk of Pakistan as consciously building. Like once you decide to have a nation, you do need this curriculum. You need this, let's put it bluntly, brainwashing of some kind to bring yourself together as a nation. And I, I lived in the Philippines right when martial law had started. And I watched a young Marcos, the dictator, let's call him, gradually try to create the Philippines as a national identity because it didn't come naturally. <clears throat> All these islands, they speak so many languages. And now they have to see themselves as having a flag, a currency, an ambassador, a seat at the UN, what comes with nationalism today is this whole superstructure of the United Nations and a flag and all these things. And because the way I'm built, sort of my ethnicity, I notice the people who don't get to be in a nation right now. Like I would say people in refugee camps, including so-called Palestinians, they don't have a nation precisely because they're not free to move around. They have to stay there. They have to stay in Gaza. They have to stay in the refugee camp. You must stay. And there's a tendency of nations, in my mind, to morph into prisons. Uh, ha having been in Bangladesh and many places, the first urge of these people is, I want to leave. Why can't I? And it's like, all of a sudden, it's this barbed wire fence around you, and you are in prison, and they call that a nation. So there's a part of me that hates nations. I find them oppressive and I want to destroy them. But then I see a nation like Tibet, which was destroyed. It was destroyed by the China nation. And yet Tibet in some extent still exists. And I call it a diaspora nation. And then I look at giant corporations and I think what my mission is, is to facilitate the creation of many, many, many diaspora nations that do not require a large piece of contiguous land on the globe. They don't need to be a jigsaw puzzle piece, which are primitive proto-nations right now. They take themselves so seriously as having these vast territories. I think that's somewhat laughable. None of them exist really anyway. They're just in your mind. But in the future, we will have more diaspora nations where people don't fight over land so much because they don't think that way, right? So I'm looking forward to the future nation as a more mature incarnation of what today are still very primitive, silly nations. But, you know, we live in the time we live. We can't help it. All right, onwards, next person. Okay, and so that was a good overview of where we're at, a good... And then now we ask Jerry, who inspired us to be here today, what do you take from this and what do you give us? My uh, my basic comment and thoughts on this have to do with foundations. I'm a foundations person, and I see consciousness and language as been, being inexplicably connected. 
You cannot separate them. And the best model I have to try and describe that is a quaternion, where consciousness could be viewed as a unity and language is divided into three different basis elements, which interrelate with each other in a peculiar sort of way. And so if you look at consciousness in that kind of model, and you say, how can conscious entities cooperate with each other or interact with each other to form additional organizations that would be conscious? You look at how the languages interact, how they communicate and interact with each other. So that would be the, the question that I would pose for the group is to look at <clears throat> consciousness and language in that kind of way and see how that makes sense or doesn't make sense with the ideas that each of you are talking about. That's, That's very it. helpful. And so this idea of language, you know, we can take it a step further and, and certainly nations are related to language. And I think another element that I like that Kirby um, introduced was the idea of creating a community, a culture, a diaspora. That's what Math for Wisdom is supposed to be about, you know. So this is a real. Uh, I'm glad Indre is here. I'm glad we're all, Daniel's here. We're all here because we're trying to create a community. It's hard to have a discussion with ten people. Franz had to leave, but he's very much into this whole spirit of the diasporas, and. Um, I think the Jewish nation is really a paradigm in terms of like how this really fantastic civilization could survive for thousands of years um, as diasporas. Um, and so um, then, of course, you know, so that's a, so maybe now, uh, like if everyone who would like, who would be very happy to have people jump in with another round, uh, but especially, you know, Indra, Daniel, Samuel, uh, my father. Uh, John, who would like to speak on any of this? Indra, do you have more thoughts? What do you, what what did you think of today? I guess I agree with Samuel. It's very fast. It's moving very fast. It's extremely fast. And we have so many ideas, and I mean, they just gallop in different ways. Uh, so I don't know what the format is. Is it like, is it a continuous, uh, continuous uh, effort to explore it, or is it one time? Well, this is a, so maybe I'll just explain. Um, Math for Wisdom has different study groups. Aslam leads our sociology study group. John leads our physics study group. Jerry leads our language of wisdom study group. We can have more study groups. I'm talking with Samuel. You know, we'll have events about music. We have an email group uh, where we'll be writing about this. You're, uh, very, you're very welcome to join. Uh, I'm glad to say Daniel just joined. And then we're having... Um, uh videos so like i'll do a video with samuel um uh and certainly you know any any participant i'm very glad to do a video about like what's your relationship with truth what's your deepest value and then then we can proceed like how to think about this so i'm very glad you came uh because i know you really i yeah, know but, the lithuanian nation uh, yeah, is very real because for you. if if you have if you have questions or collecting questions like the questions mm -hmm. for me would be like what is we and them what is we and them and how does that form and uh, just in general you mean uh, like any kind of we how does we form or if we talk about the consciousness of the nation it's probably different from the consciousness of another nation if we talk about something that is common to everyone uh, as a whole then what is that are we looking for, for something that is common to everyone? Do we need and, these separations? Uh, what does it, what, how is it? <laughs> what how it, how does so it arise? On. And something that Samuel said that I made me think was, he said, when the elections happen, everyone's consciousness goes down, you see. But for in but, my but theory, I know a moment where where America was so much united, and that is eleventh of September, probably. Maybe yeah. So, 
so sometimes consciousness well but even consciousness can go down well so individual consciousness can go down is maybe the times when national consciousness goes up you see because the consciousness of the nation is being determined on a different level it's not just a collection of people it's a collection you know so when you're electing you're creating history you're deciding who's going to speak for the nation it's amazing that donald trump is the only person who can speak for a vast amount of you know like if he was eliminated it would start a war because there's no other person who can say what donald trump would say that's fascinating you know he's such an important person uh so i kind of diverted there but um but to say so what is conscious like you say how does it arise how to become we and i think my point was that a lot of it is inborn. You know, we, like you were saying, we grow into a family. I, I don't think we need to answer it now. It's just like... No, no, no. So that's a question. <laughs> yeah, You're right. Yeah. And I... I and, not and, okay. I'll and investigate then it. There are, I mean, when I was... At some point when I was uh, thinking about uh, moral stuff, there was also... Um, somebody was mentioning two ways of cultures to regulate egoism. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which is like okay when I mean, you can think of a, on, on not an egoism maybe or na nationalism <laughs> but but there was this idea of uh, of uh, contract and the idea of anvil which brings us to insects <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah daniel just had to leave release a release and not anvil what is the name hive beehive oh yeah beehive, beehive. so daniel is an expert yeah, so uh well, he did his postdoc on beehive, I mean, on ant colonies and things like that. So I'm hoping, you know, I will oh, pursue him so that he works with us. He just had to leave. We're all probably leaving. Uh, Samuel, what's your what's your word to say? Sorry, I just wanted to jump in real quick because um, I had this discussion with another group that uh, that me and Brent have assembled to try to build some sort of digital infrastructure to help ah. coordinate um the communication and collaboration of people but one thing that keeps coming up is this idea of, like ants or beehive or you know like these these hive creatures you know where that's like they're all you know perfectly coordinated and um they have like these stigmergic markers like pheromones where they like communicate like how they're going to organize on a on like a totally different level and you know i think it's interesting to relate that to human beings because in one sense we're trying to get away from like a top-down totalitarian style of organizing but at the same time we can't help but recognize that that is the most efficient display we've seen in nature is like the ants serving the queen mm. and the bees serving the queen and you know maybe there's a whole nother philosophical discussion about the matriarchal uh you know characteristics of that but still it, it's striking to me because it's like at the end of the day we all want our own personal freedom we want the ability to pursue our own desires and realize our own dreams within this social fabric and as we've seen in history, totalitarian regimes are almost completely opposed to that. And so I don't know, I, I feel like there's something in there, there's some sort of minutia of like, looking at nature, but realizing that like, we are, we're primates, you know, we're some of the most savage creatures. If you look at, I mean, I just watched a, a documentary on primates that still live in the jungle, and they, they fight over things like food and and sexuality and they'll literally kill each other over trivial little things that we would consider trivial now. So, you know, I don't know where to go with this, but basically it's like there's, I guess we're looking for some sort of um, hybrid kind of organization where it's like we can reap the efficiency of a hive mind mm -hmm. creature but still have the personal agency of being a wild ape and, and swinging so about the this, jungle. This type, of, <laughs> this type of tension is what I've been trying to say is crucial for consciousness. And so when I think of like Indre was talking about the security of the mother and the child, you know, and then you say, but I want my freedom. <laughs> like, 
So sometimes, you know, to try to develop these uh, conversations amongst us and based on our investigations to see that. Uh, thank you, Sammy. And to tie that back in what you were saying a second ago, yes, the individual consciousness does seem to go down and in order to support the national consciousness, mm -hmm. you know, rising to some extent. Is that a good thing? I don't know. I think, again... And when we're when we're discussing like totalitarianism, I think it's kind of dangerous. I think it's kind of um, important to take a step back and maybe, um, I, and I, and again, maybe this is the compromise: is how can we raise our national consciousness without compromising our individual consciousness? How can we elevate them at the same rate so that you know we're not compromising the efficiency of organization over like the the will to live so to speak right like Ex you know, excellent cause... question uh john edmund does any more thoughts edmund just passes but edmund does my father has a great store of knowledge about you know just like he said he knows the 50s and subsequent decades but he knows what it's like to love Lithuania, to love America. Uh, so we want to tap into that. We'll have an episode on that someday, I hope. Uh, Aslam wants to say. Yeah, just just very quickly to a few questions. One one question was that uh, uh, one question was about what is uh, violence that Daniel asked, and uh, of course there are I think more than one way of responding or answering the question, but in in um, the literature that I work with on social movements and civil resistance and ethno-political movements, revolution, uh, some scholars define violence as any act of aggression that is intended to harm a living creature, a human being or any mm -hmm. living creature. So the destruction of property, for example, uh, then uh, is, 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 is uh, contested uh, you know, in, in, in according to this approach. So sometimes you see like Black Lives Matter movement destroying yeah. shops and people are angry about that, but less angry about uh, what has been done to the people, right? So it's, so that, I mean, again, we can make our own determination on, on the issue, but so that's one. Two, um, uh, Andre, you said we are, uh, I think, uh, not in your words, but uh, the child and mother and, and just, uh, we, we need others, and I think uh, that uh, is, is uh, one of the central uh, arguments in Eric Fromm's book, The Art of Loving. So he says the main problem of human existence is the problem of separateness. We want to be, we want to, to to escape the in in life. Our central mission is to escape ourselves, right, and to to become part of a union, a union in the form of a religion, a union in the form of a state, a union in the form of a nation which is greater than us. And for him, the strongest of the unions is the union of love, of two people coming together. So probably that makes sense. And and just very quickly, another uh, thought that I, uh, two more thoughts uh, probably will uh, support this, this notion. One is by Arling, Kage is a Norwegian philosopher explorer who the first human who I mean from what we know I know who who walked um, both to the South Pole and the North Pole spent 50 days alone in on the North Pole and then he wrote a book um, Silence in the Age of Noise and then uh, what is um, something for philosophers so he says you know when when you don't care for others there will come a time when you'll stop caring for yourself so probably also so this idea of you know being self-centered and being focused on your own needs and your own uh, uh, I don't know emotions and your own interests uh, probably is an indication that we are social beings that we need others and probably that also maybe helps explain, explain some of the collective consciousness of our existence. Um, yeah, and I, I think those were some of my thoughts wanted to share. Uh, I enjoyed uh, everyone's, uh, everyone's insights, Kirby's insights, everybody's insights were great. Thank you so much.
So thank you, Aslam, for hosting us. Um, we'll maybe conclude, unless John or Kirby, you have a brief thought, but um, anything, you're fine. And so we conclude with a prayer. Um, and Jerry, I think, uh, because you started us, and then so we'll ask you to conclude. You know, you know how to pray for us. So please help us. Uh, maybe I just want to say um, this idea, thinking through, like, for a nation to be really consciousness in the way that Samuel would like, whatever, there's got to be something bigger than the nation. You know, like there's got to be shared values that appeal to something bigger than the nations. I don't know if it, there's something could be bigger than God, but if there's a galaxy or the planet Earth or something. So that kind of good understanding. And so, uh, and you inspired us with this vision of universal consciousness. Uh, so in that spirit, I thank you all, Haslam, uh, Jerry, Indre, uh, and all for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. So, Jerry, please uh, lead us, end us with a prayer. Okay. So the basic thing, we are all conscious. We all have language. We all recognize each other as having consciousness and language that really combines us in a very integral way with the universal consciousness. We just need to keep that in mind. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm a Patreon supporter for Math for Wisdom because Andres and I have been friends for a long time, most of our lives. And the conversations I've had with him over the years have been very useful for me. Uh, he's also a big, big fan, my supporter, you know, of my work. And um, we just, we have deep conversations about math and physics that have been useful for charting the course of my interests. And, you know, I'm just, I'm grateful and, you know, I, I want to support that and, you know, our weekly or bi, you know, semi-weekly or bi-weekly conversations have been have been um, very important for me in the last couple of years, especially. So yeah, that's why I'm a supporter.